This video deals with the topics of test benches in Verilog. The outline is that we are going to look at the problem of testing and understand what exactly it involves. Look briefly at what we mean by automated test equipment. Then consider the idea of a self-checking test bench. And then we'll use this by explaining it in the context of a sequential multiplier and show how we can possibly construct a test bench that could test the behavior of such a circuit. So what's the purpose of testing? Once again, this over here, we are primarily interested in the testing of Verilog models. Therefore, we need to recall that HDLs or hardware description languages describe behavioral models. They are based on some kind of a behavior specification. And the question that we ask is, how do we check that the model that has been written or created meets the specifications that we started out with. The approach that we use is once again, use the same hardware description language in which the behavioral model has been described and create something called a test bench. Now this term test bench comes from the time when we actually put circuits on benches, connected up equipment in order to provide inputs and take their outputs and actually power the entire system and try it out. Whereas the test benches that we are talking about are mostly software based test benches. What they do is they create an instance of the device under test in the hardware description language, create a test rig, which is essentially once again, HDL code that can supply inputs to this DUT. We know what kind of outputs are expected or we either pre-compute them or we can compute them on the fly. And we compare the outputs against what is expected and flag any errors that might be seen. So this is a general approach that we take for testing models that have been written in a hardware description language. Now, in general, there are a number of different methods for testing circuits. And some of these methods are post-production. Some of them are while we are actually just at various different stages of the synthesis and layout process. There is a whole theory around the topic of automated test pattern generators, where essentially the idea is that you have a digital circuit, try and generate all possible random patterns as inputs and test all possible behaviors. In general, this is impossible because the state space, the number of inputs, uh, if we have n inputs, essentially the state space or the number of different possible inputs that we can give is already exponential in the number of inputs. And if we have internal registers, then those also need to get added. And the overall state space of the system can be prohibitively large. The next possibility is that we do some kind of functional simulation, either with random vectors or some kind of targeted test vectors. We know what kind of inputs are likely to be seen by the system in real conditions, or we know what kind of inputs are likely to cause problems. We apply those specifically and check whether the system behaves correctly under those targeted inputs. A third approach is something called formal verification. This tries to verify automatically using the theorem proving methods, whether the implemented logic matches the mathematical specification model. This is in some ways and the ideal situation. Having said that, actually creating the mathematical model and also implementing the formal verification process are both very difficult and therefore this is not yet a sort of a regular process. It, when possible, it should always be done, but it may not always be possible to do formal verification of circuits. The approach that we are going to follow is functional simulation for the most part of this course. In other words, you need to create a set of targeted test vectors that you know what the output should be like and see how the system behaves when those vectors are applied as inputs. So what does a Verilog test bench look like? It looks like a Verilog module, just like any other Verilog module. One interesting thing you might notice is that it does not have any inputs or outputs. And the reason is because the test bench is sort of the most basic system, the one inside which the device under test or the design under test is instantiated and all inputs are provided by the test bench and all outputs are monitored by the test bench. So the test bench that I'm showing over here would be something that you might use, for example, if you wanted to test an adder. You have two registers A and B and another wire 
which would take the sum coming out of the adder. The adder itself is instantiated as a design under test. And what you have is, what you will notice is that there is the named signal connection where I give dot sum of sum dot a of a dot b of b and so on, which makes it very clear which particular signal is getting mapped to which input port of the adder. So you don't need to worry about the order in which the ports have been declared while writing the original module code. You make sure that each input is uniquely mapped. This is always good coding style because it ensures that if at some point you need to add a new signal somewhere in your design, it does not upset any other places where your design has been instantiated. So the test bench basically consists of a design under test and some variables which can provide inputs and can monitor the output. A typical test case setup would look like this and you'll notice that we are using the initial block over here unlike the always block and the initial block is essentially something that is used in very log code in order to do something which happens once essentially at the beginning of the simulation as you might imagine this does not have any corresponding equivalent in hardware apart from using a reset signal it does not really make sense to say that something needs to be done as soon as a system is switched on the only way that you can control what happens when a system is switched on is by controlling what happens in the reset behavior. And this is not something that can be done using initial blocks. In any case, as far as the adder is concerned, a basic test might look something like this. Apply two inputs, A is equal to zero and B is equal to zero. And then check immediately whether the sum is equal to whatever it is that we expect to be C over here. Of course, in this case, it should not be 10. The sum should be equal to zero itself in this case because after all both the inputs are zero and we should expect that the sum should be equal to zero now these delay elements that you see over here are optional and are should not really be required for the correct functioning of the circuit they are mostly there in order to make it easier for us to visualize what is happening on waveforms on the output uh, uh, of the simulation What we have over here is the concept of something called a self-checking test case. For example, I know that if A is equal to 100 and B is equal to 20, the two inputs that I have over there, the output should be equal to 120. And therefore, I can put in a line over here which says that if sum is not equal to 120, do something, display an error or increment a count or something which basically indicates that something went wrong. In the ideal situation, rather than displaying error, you should probably just accumulate the number of errors and at one point, right at the end of the simulation, print out the number of errors and print a pass or fail message along with that. Now, similarly, you could also handle extra cases. What happens if your input itself is outside the 8-bit data range? You would realize that a value of 300 is well outside the range of what can be, uh, what can be represented using 8-bit two's complement numbers. But if you look at it, what you'll realize is that 300 when represented in 8 bits would basically look like 44. And therefore, we should be looking for the sum to have the value 44 plus 20 or 64 in this case. All of this depends on the designer. You as a designer need to know what to expect. It may not be something as simple as just adding the two values together. It may also need to take into account the fact that you have a limited number of bits and so on. So the example that we have, the more complicated example, is the one involving a sequential multiplier. Once again, we have a similar kind of module definition for the multiplier. It has a clock, it has a reset signal, two inputs A and B, and it also has an output P, the product, and a ready signal to show when it is done. The multiplier logic looks roughly like this. Over here, I have intentionally left it incomplete. But the idea is that you can fill this in and get a correct behavior by essentially implementing something which does a repeated shift and add of the multiplicand based on the different values of the multiplier bits. The important point as far as we are concerned is what does the test bench look like? We have the design under test, which is instantiated. And the next line after that highlighted over here shows that we are essentially creating a clock signal with the simple statement, always hash five clock is equal to not clock, which means that 
every 5 nanoseconds the value of clock toggles between 0 and 1. In this way we have created a 10 nanosecond clock purely for simulation purposes and this is something that is very important to keep in mind. Remember that the numbers that you have over here hash 1, hash 5 and so on are purely for simulation. They do not correspond to actual delays in hardware. So anything that you do over here just because it passed by giving a certain number in a simulation has absolutely no implications on whether or not the actual circuit that you build will run at that speed. The numbers that we put over here are purely for convenience for us to understand what are the different delays. And in the case of post synthesis or post placement simulation, they might actually also take into account the actual delays through the circuit itself. One very useful construct that is possible to use in test benches is the idea of a task and similarly functions. A task is essentially something like a function call and in this case if you look carefully at the task you'll notice that what it does is it essentially applies the reset to the multiplier, waits for one clock edge, removes the reset and then keeps on looping until the ready signal coming back from the multiplier becomes non-zero. In this way we can essentially make the test bench wait for a certain number of clock cycles or wait until the data comes back from the uh, multiplier and check whether the data has been correctly read or not. Similarly just like we did for the case of the adder we need to use self-checking test cases. We apply two values a and b reset and crank dut. This was the task that we defined earlier and then we can check the value that is output that is generated at the output. P over here of course is coming out from the sequential multiplier and we could have some other function or maybe a pre-computed set of values stored in a file that tell us what the expected value of P is. So to summarize how we go about testing, the quality of test cases that we use for verifying functionality in a Verilog circuit is very important. Ideally we should be looking for corner cases for example, when you multiply, you might want to look for cases where one of the multiplier or the multiplicand is zero or is negative or both are negative. Those are the typical corner cases that are easy to miss or are easy to go wrong when you design a multiplier just using regular positive binary numbers. It is absolutely essential to get self-checking test benches for large systems. Maybe for small systems, it might be enough to actually just print out the values and verify them by hand and see whether they match correctly. But for any non-trivial large system, you need to have self-checking test benches so that you can be sure that any changes you make to the code do not break the behavior of the overall system. Functions, tasks, initial blocks, file input output, all of these kinds of non-synthesizable constructs are very common in test benches and very useful. So it's definitely something that can be used quite extensively in the context of test benches. Now, when you design something like a CPU, you may also have higher levels of testing. Rather than just testing the individual modules like adders or multipliers, most likely what you would need to do is apply directly instructions into the entire system and see whether all the parts of the CPU work together in order to execute those instructions and get the correct output behavior. 